Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the Amani Project. My name is Nicole Annika Hamilton. And listen, I am so glad, so happy, in fact, to be coming back to spend some time with you today. Today, we're going to be getting into some more wonderful conversation, and in particular with the wonderful Wayne Mangesha is going to be joining me for the next hour or so. Welcome, Wayne, to the Amani Project. So good to have you here. I'm happy to be here. It's so good to see you again, Nicole. It's good to see you too. How wonderful it is to share space, let me say, with humans. <laughs> you know, especially now when I feel like the opportunity to do so has become so much more minimized over the course of the past couple of years. So I'm uh, my level of gratefulness when I get to be among people, mm -hmm. I feel, has increased significantly. Yeah, it's one. Of, it's one of the things. You know, we have to kind of collect the things when we uh, that are good that came out of this. And I think when mm -hmm. we're looking at a cup half full, we will we will not uh, we will appreciate, won't we? Like yes. contact and communion in a different way. So for sure. Yes, absolutely. So tell me, how is Wayne doing? How have you been doing? I've been doing okay. I've been mm -hmm. doing okay. I've. Uh, you know, I have had the pleasure of opening a show recently, my first show in two years since the pandemic. Everything I've been doing was digital. But um, two weeks ago, I opened a live show in L.A. And it was amazing to be back amongst an audience, um, 500 people sitting side by side. It's just uh, it was exhilarating and, and really emotional. And I, I, I don't think I was even prepared how I was going to feel on that first on opening night. Um, so I feel like we're, we're, we're getting back to, to, um, to being together again. We're learning, you know, we've been learning how to socially distance and we're learning how to socially gather again. So yeah. And now we're, I'm back in Toronto and reopening Soul Pepper. We've also been yes. a sleeping giant for two years. So we're opening our first show um, in three weeks. Well, congratulations on all that you have been doing and sharing with us, sharing with community. And, you know, I, I, I want to come back to something that you said. It's I do feel like there is this relearning how to be among each other. I remember the first theater show that I went to inside of the pandemic and sitting beside someone and thinking, wow we're actually sitting next to one another. So there is a newness. It feels almost like a rebirth of learning how to be among one another in theater spaces as well. Yeah, it's going to take, um, you know, a, a trust and also, a, a, I think, um, a gentleness to sort of appreciate mm -hmm. that people have had different experiences during the pandemic. There's, you know, mental health um, for people. Ha it's, it's, it's been a journey for many. And I think... Yeah, it's not going to be one approach fits all. I think we're mm -hmm. it's, we're going to have to ease back into being together, and I think that's why the theater is critical. I think it is it has a major civic responsibility to be a part of helping us sort of social rehabilitation. I would I would call it. Yes. Yeah. You know what I've been thinking about, Wayne, and you just you sparked this memory or this thought for me rather is uh, really just how. And I've been so conscious of it, just how much art spaces, how much art, how much theater, how much art overall really has been uh, uh, a space of healing for so many of us, including myself, during the, the course of the last few years. It's it's that go-to for so many of us that um, that we need in a lot of ways in order to be able to navigate through the many changes that are happening around us. It's it's a thing that keeps me here in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even as I'm starting to move into television and film, I, I think I'll always be a theater baby because mm -hmm. it's a, it's just a different experience. You know, it's it's a different thing to sit side by side with a bunch of strangers in a dark room, and um, and recognize our experiences as you know where they're similar and where they're different. Um, and I, I just think I've always felt it's a critical part to mm -hmm. any healthy city. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's let's take a step back because there there's so much we need to cover where where you are concerned. But I'd love to share with our our listening audience, those who are gathering with us uh, so that they can know 
where did you start? Where did it all start? When you look back, how did you get started in the field? And also what inspired your journey? It started in Scarborough, Ontario, which for all the uh, Canadian folks watching will know what I mean, or Ontario. Um, yeah, it was uh, in my high school. And, uh, you know, within the Black community in my high school, we had a group called Black to the Future. <laughs> and um, I happened to have a wonderful artist named Dwayne Morgan, who was at the high school before me. He was the president of his club, and he was a poet, and he used arts to... Um, just to talk about our stories and our history. And, and I, I became the president when he left and I just understood that, that theater could be this tool. And then I uh, thought I was going to be a lawyer and, you know, make my parents proud. And uh, yeah, I was encouraged to go to theater school. And the big journey shift for me was going in as an actor and realizing actually I want to be a part of expanding the canon and making sure that our stories are written down and um, characters that uh, I can relate to are, are um, yeah, are, are put into the canon. It's not unlike what Amani's doing, you know, making sure that our stories are recorded. Right. So that was the shift for me. Right. And being told by us, yeah. you know, being told with our own voices rather than being shifted and changed to match a certain narrative that's not our own. That's right. That's right. exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's why I went from writing was, a, was the first thing I thought I needed to do. And I said, well, actually, even after you write it, it's rendered again. And it really makes a difference who's directing. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, I, yeah, in my second year, I shifted to the directing program. I want to ask you about that because one of the, the questions, I'm so glad that you mentioned the different areas, you know, and a lot of us who've been watching and um, ha have had the pleasure really to be able to receive what you have given to community over the years will know that you've operated in so many different areas. So when it comes to writing and it comes to directing, I had a student ask me this, Miss Nicole, you know, what is the difference between being a writer being a director and someone who, for example, is uh, is is managing those who are on film sets or theater sets in particular. So can you share some insights specific to your experience as a writer and your experience as a director, just to give those who are just coming in fresh, what do each of those areas look like? Yeah, I think one, oh, you know, especially in the theater, it is, it, it, the writer uh, brings the words to the table and it's, it's, a, it's a key part. It births, uh, you know, sort of the first impulse is by the writer in, in many cases in theater. And then the director is tasked to embody that, mm, help right. the actors embody that, but help the world embody that. You, you know, responsible for the design, the, the, the rhythm, the sound. I mean, you're, you know, obviously you have designers who will, who are, who are craft all of these things, but as a director, you're honing that and you're making sure that it embodies the world in a way that you feel serves the play, serves that mm -hmm. writer. And so you can see very quickly how culturally, if you don't understand what you're rendering or what you're trying to embody, it can become skewed. Right. Um, so yeah, I think the director's job is to is to take those words and make them embodied and, and visceral and sort of help the actors do that and help all the designers do that in, in one world to sort of connect everybody so that they're doing it together and that the audience believes that that world is timeless. It ever was and ever uh, will be. Ah, the believing part. Now that resonates with me because I feel like a lot of the times, uh, Wayne, over the years that um, that I've watched, for example, I can think of certain films, uh, uh, um, TV that I've taken in. The, the reason why a lot of those films, for example, over the years have sat with me is because they've been believable. So I appreciate the the believing part. Is that, do you think that that is something that uh, is essential to the criteria of producing something that is a strong work, ensuring that it is believable? Is that part of it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that, I think people come to the theater um, 
they want to, uh, they're ready to move, not necessarily something believable as far as equating it to reality, but something that is, that, that transcends it actually, that, that, that has meaning, it's poetic. Mm. So I don't know about, it's, it's not, um, sometimes when people recognize themselves, when they taste the authenticity of a, of a moment or of a cultural, of a character, let's say, they're sort of invested. And, and then once that's the case and we understand what the relationships are, if they fly to the moon for a moment, that's okay. We're with you. <laughs> right. You know, so, it, so belief varies, but there has to be something that allows us to invest into that world. And it might start with something like, like something believable or authentic to them or their cultural world. But really what it has to do with is seeing true relationships, mm. seeing true stakes, seeing, you know, um, a real contemplation that a character is having and uh, a predicament and a choice they make, yes. um, which is why we always talk about, you know, motivation in theater for actors and like, what, what, what are you actually trying to do? People want to watch people make choices. Mm. Wow. And I'm thinking about, um, yes, the, the believable part, what has also caused some of my favorite films to be some of my favorite films, for example, is when they speak to my spirit, you know, and they, I can feel that there's something there that's moving me deeply on the inside and that's connecting me to that storyline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. You know, I think it's, it's so, um, it's such a beautiful thing when we can uh, sit down and look at the why, you know, because over the years when I thought, oh, this is my favorite TV show or this is my favorite film, when I actually think about the why, a lot of times it's helped me to actually further understand uh, me, further understand Nicole as a human, as an artist, when I understand the why of the things that I actually take in. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for that. So I want to continue to take a step back by asking you about the, the preparation that it took um, for you to operate in the work that you do, Wayne. Um, we, can, we can go to either the writing or we can go to the directing or outside of that. But what, what are some of the, the preparation outlets or training that was involved in Wayne being able to do the work that you do today? Yeah. Well, so I started off at York University in uh, in Toronto and I went into the acting program and then switched to the directing program, graduated from that, went out into, into the field and, and met some incredible mentors. I self-produced uh, and I met uh, Audrey Zina Mandela at that time, who's artistic director of Be Current, which is a company that's still around and doing wonderful work. And Janet Sears, who both, uh, both of them sort of mentored me. Um, and I joined Audrey's young company, Be Current, which we actually, I was there at the founding of, of the young company for uh, Be Current, which was called Raising the Sun, or Raising the Sun. And from there, I went on, we made, pro pro uh, you know, uh, some productions that, that did really well. And then I went to Soul Pepper, where I am now. And I came here as a part of the Soul Pepper Academy, which was a two-year paid training program. Um, and I spent two years here, um, and this is where I did sort of my first professional productions. And uh, yeah, here I am 12 years later, and now I'm the artistic director of this company. Yes, yeah, and doing it so well, so well. <laughs> One of my favorite questions to ask folks is, you know, when you take a look at your, your journey, Wayne, and you see the different mountains, potentially some of the valleys, when you take a look back at where you've come, from and where you are now, what are some of the standout moments for you? I would say, you know, um, quite early on when I, when I reckon, I know it sounds, it sounds like it was an easy switch. I just went from acting to directing, but it was hard. Like I, mm. I think I, it was, it was hard to feel like there was no black Canadian female monologue to audition with at that time, um, that I could find, you know, actually Janet's, play was published it was very hard to find at that time um but again very recently published within the last 30 years in this country right. um so I think 
uh, yeah, I think that was hard to really go, oh, actually I was wrong. I should have been a lawyer. I got to go back. What did I do? I'm my parent, you know, my family was writer. Uh, but finding that there was a place for me. And, and that wasn't an easy road because when I looked around to say, okay, I'll be a director. And I tried to find other directors, female, black directors that look like me. I wasn't seeing them on any of the large stages, you know, not in Canada anyways, other than Jan Sears, who was, I just followed her around. I was like, please mentor me, you know? Um, and she had a lot of people doing that, you know, because we, we there was a limitation of, of folks working at that level. Um, we're doing wonderful work, you know, through um, City and Theatre Company and, uh, and other companies around town. But, um, you know, it just, it looked like the horizon was limited. Mm, right. So that's a scary place to start a career. Um, but I think I was just really determined to change, to be a part of that change. So I think the low also was the high, you know, it was the fuel. Ah, yes. And when you mentioned the, you know, just going after the mentorship. I think that that's so important to make mention of because there's, there are times when I've sat down with emerging emerging artists rather who have said that um, sometimes there's a hesitation to ask, can you mentor me? Because the fear might be that that individual doesn't have time to do it. So I think it's quite special that share that you gave that, you know, keep going after it because you never know if that individual will actually have the time to say, you know what, I'm going to give that time to you. You also have to earn it, right? Like mm -hmm. I I knew what she was doing. She had a festival called the African Canadian Playwrights Festival. And I was determined to get my play in there because she's the artistic director, you know, so that I had something to say, I'm I am working my I'm working my butt off. Can you right. it, you know? Cause you know, I think it's also important that you, you know, being somebody now who's approached, um, it's important that you also go as far as you can on your own, you know. Um for, for two reasons. For one, to show that mentor that you are serious. And two, to continue to make sure that you understand what your voice is without any questions uh -huh. or compromise. It's really important to develop that. You know, I think if you're, the question has to be developed enough, rigorous enough that you're going to intrigue that mentor, you know? So you've got to try some things on your own. Um, so I, I did that, you know, I, I tried my, I, I, I asked everybody in my first year of university to I wrote a play and I was like, can you guys please help me? I was begging and boring, getting, getting lights, doing this. And I did it at a library theater and I, and I got one of these um, black artistic practitioners to come to the show. And I just really tried to get it into the African-Canadian Playwrights Festival. And then when I did, she came to the reading and then I approached her after. And, you know, so again, you, you, have, to, you have to build, carve that own, your own path. And, you know, your mentors will meet you there because you're putting that faith out. You're putting that, that um, you're working as hard as you can. Right. And, 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 and if you believe and you meet it with the work, that's the recipe. Right. So are you suggesting that that, that is done before even approaching a I mentor? I think so. I think yeah. so. I think you need to ask, you, you need to know what you're asking of that mentor. Mm -hmm. You need to try everything. So that you can ask, so that you have questions that are, um, that that mentor can ask, can answer, you know, right. I, I, I think that's, it's just important to, uh, to recognize, okay, this mentor has gone through all of these things, spent this, man, this much, this many years, I am going to put my best foot forward and work as hard as I can on my own until I feel like I can't get further and then ask for that guidance. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think there's, you know. We, we went into every festival we could with the, the money that we put, put together. You know, when we did the kink in my hair, the first time was at the Fringe Festival. And we got into the New York Fringe Festival. We took our hairdressing chair on the Greyhound bus. And I think we had like $47. And we all stayed in a, in a one bedroom house with no hot water. It was like 11 women. It was like, it was, you know, we were on, we, set, we stayed so far away from the downtown New York core that we had one person on wake up duty because we would go on the subway and one person would have to stay awake. So they could wake us, the rest of us up and walk to our place. Like, you know, we grinded. Yes. And, um, yeah. and so when I got to the point where I got in front of that mentor, I had questions. I had real questions and I, and I could speak about what I have tried to do, where I've seen, where I've seen roadblocks and where I could use help. 
Ah, I see that. Okay. I love that. I love that. And I got to tell you why. (laughs) <laughs> I love that because you're coming with, in the manner in which you share that, now that mentee is coming with, yes, the questions and a deeper understanding of their own why. I, that's what I'm getting from what you're from what you're saying, a deeper understanding of their own why um, instead of just coming empty-handed. 100%. It's a two way yeah. street, right? Like, I think right. it, it gave us a boost after all of that. I remember when we got like top five in the New York Fringe after with all that hard work. And we were able to come back with something to show yes. and say, like, we need help now. Like, we did this on our own. We need help now. But I think mm-hmm. to say, hey, how do I, how do I start? Um, there's enough information out there. Mm-hmm. You start with your heart and you start with what you really want to say and you write that thing. You figure out how to share it. And especially, you know, look at us, we're on StreamYard, especially now, you know, Mm -hmm. you see it in, you know, the music industry, people are, they'll make their mixtapes, you know, and yeah, so I, 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 the effort, it's, it's, there has to be the reciprocity. You have to understand that this mentor with the respect that this person's gone through so much and you meet them with that. Um, and then you will hear something back. I think that's just, yeah, I think oh, that's part of it. This is good. This is good. It is because I really do think about the amount of times that, you know, mentees, mentors in different spaces that I've been in and have sat down, had conversations of, okay, where do I start is normally that first question. And so I really appreciate what you've shared because when you've done, I'm going to use that word, the grinding mm-hmm. And then you're coming with um, a deeper understanding of, of, of your own practice, even if it's not a full understanding, but some sort of an understanding of your own practice, some sort of an understanding of the why. And you've already begun there. You have already put yourself in a position to know the questions that you want to ask that mentor. So there is a stronger start between that mentor and mentee relationship. And that mentee that, yeah. understand that mentor understands. Oh, these are these would be very valuable question answers for this person because they've tried this thing, and you know, it just makes that time really valuable. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, there's always there's always there's always room for for conversations. But I think if people want to really, you know, a deep mentorship, that's a that's a way to pursue it. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful share. And I'm I'm curious in your grinding, in your journey, this this beautiful journey from what we're seeing from the outside. What has been some of the, if you don't mind sharing, some of the best advice that you have obtained from those who have mentored you? Is there anything that stands out for you that's really impacted uh, your life, perhaps how you create? Um, just the sort of the why not. Mm. It's sort of a density of just being like, well, we, that's where we belong. Um, I think, yeah, I think that it's, it's been the boldness is genius method, you know, um, that's been kind of a, what I've been inspired by in other people. Um, and it, as far as advice, you know, preserve your, your unique voice, take time with it spend time with watching art and theater and thinking about what you like, you know, really take time to hone your voice. And uh, yeah, because ultimately at the end of the day, that is the thing that is going to take you the furthest is your, your individual original artistry. Mm. So what if an individual doesn't know what their voice is? What if an individual doesn't know what their artistry is supposed to be? Well, they know that they're intrigued in art, right? If they're in that position to ask that question and then you ask them why. And you just have to keep digging with that why. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so good, Wayne. So good. So I I do want to to ask you, as uh, as I know we're coming to a close very shortly, I just want to keep you here. I'm just going, I'm just going to say, and I, I, I wish that I could just keep you here for the next three hours because I have questions. But I'm so enjoying spending this time with you today. And I am curious to know, you know, I just asked about uh, a piece of advice or, or something that has really resonated or stood out to you. 
what in your mind, as those that are coming up behind you, what would you say? What do, any words of wisdom that you would give to an individual? And you've dropped so many already, but words of wisdom that you would give to those aspiring educators, those artists, those change makers. What would you say? In addition to what I would given? say, it is heart talent. It's our heart. It is. It is, all, it is all of those things. It's our impulses. It's our voice. It's preserving that. It's making sure you never compromise that. But it's also met with real muscular rigor and work. You know, I think we get, we can, we can think because we don't work with hammers and nails um, that we don't need to like work our muscles every day. But, you know, you think about like Toni Morrison, you know, when you hear her in interviews and uh, she's like, I write every morning. Four o'clock in the morning. I don't care if I have pages or not. I sit there. It's my job. So it's it's that rigor, the same way that you would work out in the gym and you would create the discipline and you would create the hours and you would work at it. Um, that's the discipline is really important. And working at it every if you're a writer and you want to write, give, make yourself write every day, every day. Um, something will come at it because that faith and trust and it is, it is honing your voice. It will come to you, you know? Yes, yeah. I have a friend of mine who's a, a writer said that she keeps that pad beside her bed at all costs so that if she wakes up in the middle of the night, <laughs> if an idea comes to her in a dream, she's ready. She's ready to write it down. And sometimes that's what it is. It's just about not, um, not waiting uh, mm -hmm. for an idea to come to you, but it's sitting down at that desk when you don't necessarily want to so that that idea knows that you're ready for it, you know? Ah, <laughs> but you got to meet yeah. it there and yeah. you don't make space for it. It might not come. So you have mm -hmm. to be worth that. You have to tell yourself that that, that is what I want to be and I'm going to make the space for it to enter my life. Yes, beautifully said. Wayne. I have to tell you, you are joy. You are joy, wrapped <laughs> in joy, wrapped in joy. It's been such a pleasure to sit down with you. I do want to ask you before you go, what's next for Wayne? What's next? And it, it, whether it's career-wise, whether it is otherwise, but what's next for, for Wayne? Um, well, you know, I've, as I moved from directing to artistic direction, now it's, a you know, I'm programming and, and supporting um, uh, other writers and, and, and making sure that all the work and all the art that everybody makes, sees the light of day, gets on stages, um, connecting communities. That's to me, having a conversation, a larger conversation with the city, not just one audience, but an audience across a season of plays. That's really exciting to me. Um, and then, yes, I'm going to start to move into film. I'm doing TV now, but feature film I've never done. I've only done shorts. So the next goal is a feature film. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Wayne. And so wonderful to hear what's next for you. I have to tell you, it's 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 truly an honor. It's it's a joy to watch the work that you have done. And so I say to you, thank you for all again that you have poured out. Um, I'm receiving it and have been so blessed, so blessed significantly by the work that you have done. So thank you. My thanks yeah. to you. Thank you. And thanks you to the Imani Project for doing this. This is um this is really important work, and I really appreciate you taking record of all of these incredible artists. So thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yes, we're making history. History, you and I, we're making history with Amani. We're making history having these conversations and archiving them so that they will forever be captured. So I appreciate you saying that. We do. Appreciate you, Wayne. Thank you again. Thank you. A pleasure. Well, that was Wayne Mangesha. Listen, what a beautiful, beautiful wonderful opportunity to sit down with Wayne and to have a good chat with regards to her experience, her journey, how she has come this far. And listen, let me tell you, don't go anywhere because we have so many more conversations that are going to be coming up. We are so grateful that you've been spending time with us. So until next time, I'm Nicole Inika Hamilton. Thank you for joining us at the Imani Project. We'll see you again very soon.